at the camera. It's a thing I do. So hello, hello, hello. This is Warren Redlick. Thank you for watching. I'm here with Dennis Kucinich. Dennis Kucinich was the mayor of Cleveland. I believe he is now running again for mayor of Cleveland. I know him best as one of my favorite members of Congress, even though we probably don't agree on a lot of policy issues. One of the most ethical, one of the most honest people ever to be in Washington, D.C., Really happy to have you on. And we're here to talk about your book, at, at least to start, at least talk about your book, Division of Power, a Division of Light and Power, Division of Power and Light. What, am I getting that wrong? Division of Light and Power. You got it right. And is that, is it like a double meaning that it's about Muni Light, but it's also about the division of light and power in politics? Is that, does that make sense or is that, was that not intended? No, Warren, uh, you're one of the only people who's ever recognized that. I just want to point this out, that the book is about our municipal light systems, the battle to save it, but it was called, the system was called the division of light and power. Yeah. But as you point out, uh, there is another meaning there. Yeah. And I, and I want to uh, uh, acknowledge that you picked up on it and to say uh, you are 100% correct. Okay. So I feel when I read your book, sometimes people write a book and you're just reading a book and sometimes you can hear the person's voice and I know your voice and I could hear your voice while I was reading it. I, I sent this to uh, whoever I was communicating with in advance. Um, I don't know. Do you have a, a short quote from the book you'd be ready to read or do, do you not have that ready? Uh, I could get it mo momentarily. Ah. That's all right. I, I just want to, I'll, we'll move on. I, I, I thought maybe we could do that. And if, if it's not ready, I know your time is very limited, so I don't want to waste it. Um, what, there's a question that I was prompted to ask you that I love. They gave me a you know, bunch of questions to ask you. There's one I particularly love. The question is, why should Americans pay attention to the way their governments operate in order to get a perspective on the way a positive and honest approach can help citizens? The only way our, our nation works is if government's honest. When government is dishonest and lies to the people, it breaks down. And when you break down that trust, trust is the only thing that holds the country together. And it, trust is essential to driving a car, to flying a plane, to going to a doctor's office, to having surgery, to uh, buying the food. I mean, when you think about trust in everyday life, it's essential. It holds, it's a glue that holds the society together. And when government can't be trusted, oh, my God, because the government has a lot of power. And when that power is used to help a few at the expense of the many, crony capitalism, when it's used to take the country to war based on lies, devastating, when it's used to favor Wall Street over Main Street, the Federal Reserve over the needs of the uh, community, it's devastating. So, yeah, um, we want to be able to trust our government, but the only way you do that is through being involved. It, it, it requires an active citizenship, to, um, uh, which means studying what's happening, paying attention, asking questions, not being afraid to stand up at a meeting and say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, doing research that may require you to become ever more involved. And local government is the closest to the people. I mean, this is where people actually have a chance to be able to touch those officials and say, hey, wait a minute, or say, thank you. Uh, local government is closest. People should have some impact. And if you don't trust local government, then you have an obligation to change it. Yeah, I was actually a town board member myself. So what I was struck by when I started reading your book is you have this description. You got elected to the city council. You have this bit at the beginning where that you're out with your wife and the lights go out, your wife says what happens and you make a phone call and the guy's like not giving you a straight answer. But you talk to, I guess he's like counsel to the city councilman and you're talking to him. He's basically telling you, look, just play ball, vote the way you're supposed to vote and they'll take care of you, which is directly counter to the way you view things. And this is why I'm, I, I believe you're, you're a tremendous writer. And I, before we started, I was saying you should write a novel, but basically you did, it just happens to be true. Um, the way you described that encounter and I'm sorry to make this comparison because you might not like it, but I like Ayn Rand's novels. I don't think her hero characters are credible, but her sort of villain and ordinary characters are very well written. And I felt like when I was reading your description of what this guy said to you, that was what 
the insiders in politics that are harassing the heroes in Ayn Rand's novels, that's the way they talk. El, uh, Els, Els, uh, tu, Ellsworth Tui is the character in Fountainhead. There are characters in your book who sound like Ellsworth Tui from Fountainhead. Oh yeah, listen, you know, you're, you're uh, correct in drawing that, uh, uh, that line because uh, look, every, every day is a spiritual challenge for each of us as individuals. Yeah. Uh, when you go into government, you have to decide who you are. Are you gonna be uh, one of the crowd that uh, goes along uh, in order to get along or are you gonna take a stand if you see something wrong? You know, I, I was I, I, I have a certain spiritual compass that guides my decision making and causes me to weigh things in every moment. And it, it came about, uh, Warren, as a result. I mean, I, I had a moment in my childhood where I'm in a Catholic school in Cleveland and the uh, sixth grade sister Leona's classroom sister walks out. Uh, tells the classroom, read your books. Well, of course, they didn't do that. She came back. The classroom was in chaos. She was not happy. Uh, she said, Every, everyone take out a piece of paper and a pencil. And she went to the board and wrote a poem. And when she wrote that poem, uh, after she was finished, she said, now, children, I want you to write this poem down. So we wrote it down. And then she told us, you're going to go home tonight and you're gonna write this poem 50 times. And the children were like, oh my God, you know, this is horrible punishment. How could you dare do this? Well, here's the poem. It's called The Minute. And if you wanna know anything about me and uh, how I weigh every moment, this poem will tell you, and thank you, Sister Leona. I have only just one minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. Give account if I abuse it. Heaven help me if I lose it. Just one tiny little minute. But eternity is in it. I love it. So, you know, I mean, I believe there's such a thing as a soul. And, and, I, and there is such a thing as right and wrong. And you, you have to have a moral calculus in every moment so you don't, Kind of go astray and search a power or wealth or whatever and um and the book the division of light and power is certainly uh a, a an unfolding of that kind of principle in action because we're talking about spiritual realism here i'm not talking about something theoretical i'm talking about how do you put into practice every day what your spiritual values are if you happen to be in politics oh boy <laughs> well so I read your book and I come at it from a libertarian perspective and I see your book as reaffirming the libertarian view that government is inherently corrupt, that people like Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul are rare, and that the, the halls of Congress and the, the city halls around the country are, are infested with corrupt people who will not do the right thing. Why wouldn't the answer be, let's make sure government has as little power as possible so that the corruption is minimized? Well, you know, uh, the power is money, okay? And uh, a government's ability to get money. When I was mayor the first time, I cut city spending by 18% without reducing services by eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse. As a member of the Government Oversight Committee, uh, I learned when I first came to Congress that the Department of Defense had over one T for trillion dollars that it couldn't account for. <laughs> Accounts could not be reconciled. Look. Government can be a racket, but it can also be an instrument for protecting people, for making sure that their, uh, their homes are safe, that uh, the streets are safe, that the, that the potholes are filled, that the uh, catch basins are clean, and you know, on and on and on. There, there is a purpose for government, but if government gets too much money uh, and can't account for it, that's when it becomes a racket. And so my job as a mayor and as a member of Congress was to look wherever the racket was going on. It certainly was going on in the Department of Defense. Oh my God, I mean, the war's a racket. And, you know, the uh, city of Cleveland, uh, you know, we had organized crime had its hooks in the city hall when I was there the last time. There were, there were contracts going for things that, that were a total 
theft of taxpayers' dollars. And when you get corporate, you know, when you get corporate power that tries to use government as their gas station, you end up with government becoming a racket to help a few at the expense of the many. Think crony capitalism taking over a government and using it for their own concerns. Yeah, I, I would say if anybody's interested, I would highly recommend it. There's a link to uh, the book in the description of the video below. Um, I wanted to ask you about something a little different. I just talked to the mayor of Fort Lauderdale a day or two ago. Elon Musk is this monster figure in American culture right now, global culture. He has a company called The Boring Company. He made a proposal to Fort Lauderdale that they're going to build tunnels under Las Olas Boulevard. I don't know if you've been to Fort Lauderdale, but basically they're going to create their own public transportation system. If Elon Musk came, you're running for mayor of Cleveland. I hope you win. If you become mayor of Cleveland and Elon Musk comes to you and says, I want to build tunnels for you under your city that will save your traffic problems, that will take noise pollution down because the traffic will be underground. It will get people where they want to go faster. It'll reduce the cost of transportation for people. It'll reduce air pollution, all these great things. And the city won't have to pay a penny. And when we're done, we'll give a city, the city a share of the revenue from this project. Does that sound like something you'd at least consider? I don't know. I mean, you have to take in things like surface geology, water tables, are there are there tunnels in Ohio? Uh, no, not no today. Because we have you know, there might there might be, yeah. But you know they don't immediately come to mind. At least any major tunnels. Somebody will probably correct me uh, instantly on this, but um, uh, I don't have tunnel vision. Okay, so. So Elon Musk is this figure, and I see political figures, particularly the Democratic Party, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're fans of these people, but the Bernie Sanders and, and Robert Reiches of the world have been, have been you know, casting shade on Elon Musk as if he's doing something wrong. Do you have a sense? I, I searched for Dennis Kucinich, Elon Musk, and I didn't find anything. Like, you've never been asked about him before. Are you familiar with Elon Musk, electric vehicles, SpaceX? Do you have any thoughts on what he's doing in America, whether he's for the good, for the bad? Is he a dangerous capitalist? Is he a great hero? What are your thoughts in general? I'd like, you know, I'd be happy to meet him and I'll decide for myself. <laughs> I mean, but are, you know, you're aware that Tesla is making electric vehicles that are driving on the roads of Cleveland today. I, I've been in them. They're very impressive. Absolutely. Do you think there's hope? And, and, and I, you know, again, when it comes to individuals, I don't let the media make my decision. I, I'd, uh, I'd be happy to meet him and uh, our paths have not crossed. I have an interest in, uh, uh, in, in the role of uh, space. Uh, the development of technologies that are spinoff from the space program are extraordinary. And so I have an interest in that. Uh, you know, Cleveland's been a big automotive capital, so I'd be interested in what he's doing there. Can we connect uh, this back to the, to, the, to the book and the division of power and light, Muni yeah. Light? I forget the current name for it. It's Cleveland Power or something like that. Um, one of the things that Tesla does is they do solar and battery storage so that you can generate electricity during the day and store the electricity okay, at night. I, I, the whole world's going to change with respect to that. And I know that. And, you know, entrepreneurs have the ability to be able to move things forward. Uh, and I, you know, I'm certainly open, <laughs> but I have to, you know, I, I, I'd want to talk to him personally to get a sense of uh, where he's coming from if he would do anything that involved Cleveland. Look, as mayor, I'm going to invite uh, leading entrepreneurs and uh, get their ideas about how uh, we can move our city forward. Um, you know, one of the things we have in Cleveland that in the West and Southwest are very troubled about is uh, we have a great supply of fresh water. We're sitting on the Great Lakes with the largest supply of fresh water in the entire world. Right. And because of that, people are going to find Cleveland attractive. We have a, we have a good infrastructure, it needs some repair. We have a skilled workforce. Uh, we have a lot of cultural amenities. Uh, you know, as mayor, I'm going to address some of the uh, service concerns with respect to crime. You know, there's a lot of violence going on. I have to work to get a handle on because uh, if you can't do that, people don't want to come to a community. But I think Cleveland has great potential. And I'd love to talk to Elon Musk and others who uh, may have some ideas. I'm an idea person. I'm open. I was in Cleveland last 
two years ago at Baldwin Wallace, beautiful city. Loved, I went, went down, watched a, like a, a theater production. This is before COVID. Um, the other thought I have, and I've asked a lot of local, I'm in Palm Beach County, Florida, and I've talked to my county commissioners and some other people on this channel. One of the things that Elon Musk is trying to do, that Tesla's trying to do is deliver self-driving cars. Waymo is sort of doing it. There's some other efforts, but I think Tesla's leading this effort and it leads to a world where the cars drive themselves and the cars drive themselves safely. And it can lead to a scenario where people don't need driver's licenses anymore because the cars drive themselves. We don't need traffic police to stop cars anymore because the cars are inherently safe. Every time I talk to a candidate about that, they're afraid to talk about the prospect of eliminating government jobs. Although you just said you cut some spending by 18% in your first stint as mayor. Do you potent, where do you think about the prospect of self-driving cars making our roads safer and potentially eliminating the need for certain jobs, government jobs? Well, you, you know, the new technology should provide a way to uh, create new jobs. You know, we always have to be aware in a society about uh, eliminating jobs. I mean, you know, let me give you an example. Our trade agreements eliminated jobs and people weren't thinking about it. And all of a sudden we have a deindustrialization. We made America weaker as we, the trade agreements made America weaker. And so, you know, I'm, I, I always am going to be looking at the, uh, the effect of technology on human beings. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead, a uh, philosopher, once wrote that uh, the greatest technological advances in societies are processes that all but destroy the societies in which they occur. So I, I'm, I, I want to I align with the potential of new technologies. The self-driving cars, look, uh, that has a terrific potential. Amazing. I mean, you think about it, that you could just you know, dial up, something pulls in front of your house, you get in, you dial a route like, you know, you do now on a, on a, on a, uh, on an app to take you to a certain direction where you're driving. Yeah. It's Uber with Uber without a driver. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to think about that. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to, uh, be on a, you know, dr be in a vehicle where I can get to where I have to go and not, you know, and be able to uh, write notes or be on the phone without worrying about creating an accident. And yeah, I, I mean, it's like more time. That's time is always valuable. It's interesting. I'm ready to think about it, but I'm also open to the broader discussion about the impact of, when you look at the impact of techno, technological changes, it's not about forestalling the change necessarily. It's about making sure when you create the change, that you understand the effects of it, because introducing technological change without appreciating its effects uh, inevitably is going to be problematic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, so I, I guess what I'm going to say is this just a suggestion for you. Watch what's happening in Las Vegas. Watch what's happening in, in Fort Lauderdale, because those are the first two boring company projects. And I think they're really going to make. I, I, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm interested and I'm certainly going to watch. OK, great. Um, is there anything else you want to tell people about your book? Link to the book in the description below. I love this book. I highly recommend it. Anything else you think people should know about your book? Well, the, the, you know, the whole idea about what it means to be an individual and taking a stand to, you know, what profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their soul about being in that moment where, you know, there's a lot riding on it and, and, and you're the one that has to make the decision. And, and you know, if you make a certain decision, you may be condemned for it because the popular opinion goes one way and you're taking a stand the other way. Yeah. I mean, I think it was uh, the playwright, Heinrich Ibsen, who said, who described society as a uh, joint stock company conspiring against the individual. And, you know, we, each of us, you know, we, we work in societies, we, I believe we're interconnected and interdependent, but we must never lose our ability to take a stand. We must never lose our ability to summon what's deep inside of us to express it to others. Uh, in the words of uh, uh, the writer Emerson, to believe that what's true for you could be true for others as well. So it is that power of the individual acting from a, a place of spirit and conscience that enables us to change the world. But I, and, I, and that's, why ahead, the book, that's why the book could be important for, for 
uh, for your audience. But I still struggle with this. I read the book. I see and I have little doubt that you are who you say you are. I served on my town board and I could see that there were others in my town who were motivated by personal interest rather than doing what's right. Um, and I, I see you. And I, the problem is that when I look at politics in general, I think you're rare. And I don't think I think that the solution of government being good for people and good for society only works if you're not rare. I don't think it works if, if the Dennis Kuciniches of the world are rare. I mean, you're, you know that you're perceived, I, 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 probably the term gadfly, I don't know what, what they call you. They, you know, they have all kinds of names for you, right? They have all kinds of names for Ron Paul. You guys are like the two honest people in Washington. Well, if you're the two honest people in Washington and there's 500 people running the country who aren't honest, your influence isn't that big. Well, actually, you know, we, we have influence at certain times that is almost outsized because, uh, you know, I think it was Andrew Jackson who said, one person with courage makes a majority. And, and that's ever true. I'm not so, sure it's true. Oh, I am very sure it's true. I, I felt it's like- not as about, a... not, Warren, it's not, about the, it's not about the temporary victories or losses. It's about the primacy of the soul. Okay. I mean, I, I did find where I was most effective as a town board member was when I asked questions. I was in the minority. It was three to two when we asked questions that made the people in power uncomfortable, that stopped them from doing bad things. It didn't. Oh, that happened, we, right. There's it proof. Did, yeah. It didn't mean we could get them to do good things. Ah, and, but it means that one must speak out. Yeah, and, no, but. And, and to challenge the smug majority at all times. But because, if, because it's interesting how one person who says the right thing at the right time could save the day, could save the town, could save the country and the world. We have to believe in our capacity as individuals to make a difference. But if, you know, the, the probably you, when you tell the story in your book about the story basically is about uh, Muni Light, which is the, the power company for Cleveland that is government owned, I believe, city owned. And right. there's this outside company that's trying to take over Muni Light and they're, they're basically buying city councilmen and they're, they're paying off people. And I think at one point they tried to assassinate you, all kinds of crazy stuff because you're, you're the thorn in their side. But in the book, you say that, that this happened in cities across the country and the ones where the Dennis Kuciniches of the world saved the local municipal, the local utility are the rare ones, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, look, a lot of utilities were taken over and, and, you know, and again, this really isn't so much about public and private as it is about uh, about uh, about truth or falsity, as it is about um, uh, crony capitalism, as opposed to the individual expression of of communities being able to make a choice of you know where they want to get their power. I mean, the ultimate power comes from within, but when you're talking about electric power, uh, it's available at a price. And if a community wants to save money, keep taxes low, they have their own system. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any problem with a private company existing, but if you're going to play dirty and you're going to buy, you know, and, you, and you're going uh, to try to sabotage our system. And this book, The Division of Light and Power is a story about corporate espionage, corporate sabotage, about law firms trying to upend the city, about a bank that, that's that stuck it to the city of Cleveland when I wouldn't sell our electric system because of crony capitalism, their business partner was the utilities. I mean, they put the city of Cleveland through a ringer yeah. in order to try to uh, force me to sell. And, and so, so this is I mean, this is an expression of organized crime. Yeah. It's just that when it when it's done by bankers, it's you know, it's seen as business as usual. It's like it's like the, you have this other encounter early in the book with this lawyer who's like the big time lawyer for the, you know, the big, big, big companies in the city. And again, it's that, it's that the language that you use, I feel like I'm reading Ayn Rand writing about one of the villains. Uh, so it's brilliant. really suggest people uh, buy this book. Uh, great read. It's not short. <laughs> it's, it's actually yeah. longer than Fountainhead, shorter than Atlas Shrugged, but well worth reading. Um, uh, real, it just, and just the, 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 the style of writing is just brilliant. Um, you triggered something in me. I lost it. Uh, I don't know. How are you on time? How much time do you have left? Well, I've got a few more minutes. 
Okay. So let's talk about running for mayor. You're running yes. for mayor of Cleveland. I uh, am. Is there, it's a primary election coming up? September 14th, the vote, uh, the absentee ballots start uh, in a month. And how many candidates are there in the Democratic primary? Seven. So because you have a big name, I would say well, that- There's no Democratic primary. It's a nonpartisan primary. Oh, nonpartisan. It's a non- but but Most of them are Democrats. So what happens at the end of the, of the September vote? Is that it or is there a runoff after that? Run, a runoff, top two runoff in, in November. So my impression is that you have outsized name recognition. Are there polls? Or my guess would be that you're probably going to finish in the top two just because of your name. Am I wrong about that? Or you, I mean, do you, are well, the polls you know, suggesting I that? I don't, take, I don't take anything for granted, but the primary looks favorable. Okay, I'm, I'm very excited for this. Um, and and one of the big issues is crime. Oh, it is the issue. Yeah, uh, Cleveland is known right now, unfortunately, as one of the most violent cities in America. There are, are shootings happening all over town, drive-by shootings. Uh, children are out in the street. They're getting shot. People just walking in their neighborhoods are getting shot. People going for gas are getting shot. They're shopping. are getting shot. They're getting carjacked. They're, the murder rate's going off the charts. Cleveland has its problems. And what I've said is that we need more police, and I want 400 more police uh, on the streets, uh, walking the beat, in some cases, traffic enforcement. I want 100 new safety assistants who, you know, we have to recognize not every police call needs an armed response. We need crisis intervention specialists who can resolve things without force. Uh, and also I've talked about creating a civic peace department, which would get into the underlying causes of the violence that's going on. So you don't, you know, you, get ahead of it, find out what's happening in certain neighborhoods, have your ear to the ground. If you hear something starting to percolate, some people talking about doing things, well, you get on top of it. You don't wait for it to be expressed and a lot of people get hurt. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking about an innovative approach, uh, respectful people's civil liberties, certainly, uh, but this whole idea that's going around in some cities about defund the police, uh, it, it not happening in Cleveland. We're going we're gonna to make sure the police are funded, that they're well paid, that they got that they have good equipment, are well educated, and uh, that they're trained in civil liberties, and that they'll uh, be an effective crime fighting force, so that we can make our streets safe again. Because if you don't have safe streets, it, it, everything else is difficult. So let me ask you this: um, You, I think, share my view that the war on drugs is a total failure and has been for a hundred years or more. Very hypocritical. And you mentioned the causes of crime. To what extent is drug prohibition a, a, a key cause of the problem that you're seeing? No, it's in... I, well, well, you know what? That's an interesting question because um, are drugs a factor? Yeah, but the sale of really hard drugs um, uh, is involved and you know, control of, it's like a control of an area or a market. People fight over territory so they can distribute it. I, you know, right, I, but, but if you sell, I, if you allow the sale of whatever your dangerous drug is in the local pharmacies, then no one's going to buy from the guy on the street corner where they can buy what they know is safe from the pharmacy. Well, and you I, eliminate as, as the you problem know, of as, violence over that. As you know, Warren, uh, drug, drug laws are, are administered by the federal government. Uh, as a mayor, I, I don't have any authority to, to create laws at a local level that would contravene uh, the U.S. code. Well, you could, you could, you could, uh, this actually, this actually came up when I was on the town board, uh, not with drugs, but you could instruct, you could basically have the city council give a directive to the police department, don't make drug arrests. No, you can't. Why not? No, not, not, no it's called peculation of a felony. You, you got to be very careful to know the law on this uh, and how far you can go. You know, you certainly set your priorities about law enforcement, but you cannot instruct the police not to enforce the law if they see a law being broken. That but we have this all the time with, with immigration and we have sanctuary cities that are doing just that. Yeah, well, and I, I'm know, an open I, borders guy. Just to be clear, I'm an open borders guy. I, I think anybody should be able to come in, but we see that happen all the time in cities. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, you're asking about drug policy. Um, 
I'm aware having served at a local state and federal level, I am very aware of what the laws are with respect to how much latitude a local official has on, on matters that relate to the uh, federal register and the, uh, the rules that govern um, uh, the use of certain kinds of drugs. So, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you may remember that it was 20, 22, 23 years ago, I stood in Congress with a congressman from uh, New York, Maurice Hinchy. I remember Maurice Hinchy. And we talked about legalizing marijuana. And, and you know, and I, I've been, uh, you know, way out front on that issue for years. There's, um, the, the, the first thing I want to do is get crime under control in Cleveland and um and look at all of the elements that are in there one of which is drugs but you know the you know in 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 doing that i want to um uh, you know i i got to be very sure about how we approach this and i'm not going to prejudge it well what else is what else do you think is causing the crime problem other than fights over turf to sell drugs what are the other big fact i mean domestic violence is domestic violence you're going to always have that problem Drunk driving is drunk driving. You're always going to have that problem until we have self-driving cars that save us from it. You know, there are certain no, gang, crimes gang, that are common. Gangs, gangs get into a lot of different gangs get into a lot of different activities, not just drugs. Uh, you know, there's there's trafficking in arms. There's um, shakedowns, uh, loan sharking, all kinds of stuff. So, you know, I'm uh, I, I'll have my work cut out for me. But the experience that I have will put me in a position where I think I'll be able to uh, make our neighborhoods uh, uh, safer. And uh, we're going to go after those who are terrorizing people in town. This oh. idea, this idea about these drive-by shootings that are occurring, we're going to put a stop to that. I can promise that uh, not just to you, but I promise that to the people of Cleveland. Now, I, I, you're known for your, I guess, opposition to the National Rifle Association, your support for gun control. And you're describing these shootings on the streets of Cleveland. What percentage of these shootings on the streets of Cleveland are being committed by lawful gun owners? Oh, I, I would imagine, uh, I would imagine uh, very few. So what, what advantage is there in restricting lawful gun ownership if the criminal, the well, so-called yeah, criminals? Yeah, you are know, I, I, listen, I don't have any problem with, with sportsmen. If you have an AK-47, the sport there generally is shooting people. Um, I'm, um, you know, I, I do have an AK 47. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, good. I mean, and, I haven't, you know, haven't shot anyone but, yet. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, you know, but I, I'm, I mean, I, there's a point at which in an urban area, uh, which is already a tinderbox in terms of, uh, crime and chaos, man, you know, I want to try to get, I want to try to get the guns off the street out of the hands of criminals. OK, sure. But if, if the Cleveland my, police just know that is my concern, I want to get the guns off the street out of the hands of criminals. Am I looking at trying to get everybody's guns? No. OK, way. well, I'm just sort of talking not so much about Cleveland, but this general issue of gun. control. No, I know. I, and look, I you know, guns are a serious issue and I'm not. Um, uh, there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's too many of them floating around the streets of Cleveland. There's people who have guns that shouldn't have guns. Uh, the people who are lawful possessors of guns and know how to use a gun uh, and are not trying to hurt anybody, you know, it's no problem there. But we've got another element in the society, which we are all familiar with. And uh, that element is out there and they're using guns to kill people. And that is happening. And that's what I got to do. You know, I have to deal with that as a mayor. And, and it's not an ideological thing, it's very practical. I wanna get the guns out of the hands of criminals and off the streets so it's not an issue. Now, one thing that strikes me that I've seen you in the media somewhat recently is, I've always thought of you as a guy who is somewhat to the left of center. Not, you're not really partisan. I would say you're more practical than anything else, but to some extent your ideology, if you have one, is a little bit more left of center. And yet it seems like we've had this, we've entered this world where people like Dave Rubin, who used to be left of center, a, a married, a gay married man, 
um, who always thought of himself as liberal, have all of a sudden been cast as right wing. And it seems like you're getting cast as this right wing guy now. And I'm like, wait, you can't cast Dennis Kucinich as right wing. Like, no matter how hard you try, like, if anybody has a brand that can't be called right wing, it's got to be Dennis Kucinich. And yet they're trying to do it to you. Where is this well, coming from? Well, look, uh, I haven't changed. Yeah. So, you know, I, I haven't changed. And it, my position as an individual with a, a, a spiritual center and a moral code remains the same. Whether I'm in office, out of office, running for office, not in business, whatever, that's who I am. And if people want, have any questions, just ask me where I stand on an issue. I'll tell you. Uh, do I know it all? Absolutely not. I mean, the longer you live, the, 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 you, you learn, the less you know. But, but let me ask you this. I, feel, I have been saying this for a while because I'm obsessed with Elon Musk, if it hasn't been obvious to you. And one of the things I love to say about Elon Musk is heroes have flaws. So if you're not familiar with this, Elon is really, really bad at predicting when something will happen. If he says he's going to deliver a product, it, it might take two or three years longer than he says. He gets there, but it takes longer. And I read your book and I'm reading your book and I'm thinking, because, because I view you as a hero, heroes have flaws. And the first flaw I see in the book, which I think you're very well aware of, is naivete. But you, it was so hard for you to accept how bad it was in, quote, City Hall, which the larger City Hall, not just City Hall itself, but the larger City Hall you describe in the book, which goes beyond the walls of City Hall. Do you agree that naivete was a was a maybe flaw is not the right word, but a weakness you had going in and what well, you know, I, I always like to, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't dispute what you're saying. I mean, I, I don't, I don't live every day with the, the theme, who knows what evil work lurks in the hearts of men. You know, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think about that. I, I try to find the best in people. And when you look for the best in people, sometimes they, um, consistently refuse to reveal it to you. <laughs> I had that experience in government, yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, today, do I have that? Uh, 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 that, no, <laughs> not at all. But the, but the person in the book, the 23-year-old, the idealist, the stars in the eyes, I, it's still me. I'm still there. I, I refuse to have anybody tell me that the world can't be better. Well, I refuse to have anybody tell me that tomorrow's not going to be a better day. I, it's up to me to try to make it that way. And I'm not going to, I, you know, I don't live with a cloud over my head. I, I, I have this irrepressible confidence and optimism in the future. Uh, now, it, it may not be translating to everybody else's life, but it works for me. And so, uh, and, and, what, and what is at the core of that is a spiritual center. I feel free all the time. I don't attach myself to to wealth or to positions or whatever, it's all, life's great. And, um, and the book, I hope, demonstrates that you can go through this crucible, which I went through. Yes. And which all of us go through at one time or another in life. You can go through this crucible and come out whole, come out stronger, come out like tempered steel right. and, uh, and, 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 and go and go into life joyously every day to be happy. And despite having, you know, been through um, what the division of light and power describes. You know, you know uh, Warren, thank you for this uh, opportunity. I, I just got a signal that says that I, I got to hit it. But, uh, you know, I really appreciate this discussion and, um, and I appreciate you communicating to your many listeners the um, uh, the information about the book, because it's an important book. And I think it will help people understand how one individual navigated a very corrupt set of circumstances and came out whole. And um, because all of us have the ability to do that. It's not just me. Everyone has the chance to do that. And um, and I think that others will read the book and sh and see themselves in circumstances where they took a stand and got slapped down but they kept coming back and i think uh uh to have a chance to talk with you about this and to really get into the deeper dimensions of it is absolutely a joy and i really 
am so grateful for your own insight, which brought this discussion to a point of, of real depth. So thank, thank you. you. You have my endorsement. If you want a hero as mayor of Cleveland, please vote Kucinich. Oh, thank you. So you're so kind. I'm so grateful for this uh, moment with you. Thanks again. And, and, and hello to all of our friends with Ron. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye now. So uh, everyone else, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up really quick. Thank you to uh, former mayor, former Congressman Dennis Kucinich, now candidate for mayor. I can still, oh, he's gone. Okay, great. So uh, I'll stay on the chat for a little bit and see if there's any questions or thoughts. I know somebody said I was too hard on Elon. I, I, I'm not hard on Elon. I, I, I think that what Elon does is all the more impressive because he's able to overcome his own failings. The hero's journey is about overcoming obstacles and the best heroes overcome not only external obstacles, but internal overcome their own flaws. That's what I was going to, that was actually the next question. I was trying to get there with them, but I didn't get there with the, with Kucinich. So uh, really, really, yeah, I was disappointed. He didn't have more to say about Elon and uh, robo taxis and boring tunnels, but he's got a lot on his plate. So let's see. Interesting interview. Yeah, this went longer than he, I was supposedly only going to get 15 minutes with him. Looks like we got 45 minutes. So absolutely great. Really love this. I hope I hope he wins, honestly. So what do we got here? Um, yeah, and, and just really quick, there's a link in the description below to the book. Highly recommend reading and I've read most of it now. Absolutely brilliant book. Highly recommend. I was reading it on my on my flight to the plaid event. And the, the boring company, uh, drive to, to Las Vegas to experience the boring company in the Plaid event. I had the book on my laptop and I was reading it really, really good. I don't, I don't know him. I was contacted, I think because I run West Poca News and he has a book and they're trying to promote the book. So they're getting contact with local media and I'm effectively local media for West Poca Raton. So, oh, Matt Sanko says, when he says he's trying to save the city utility, what does he mean? The city had a, a city owned utility that provided light and power and or basically electricity. And there was an outside utility that was trying to basically run the city utility out of business so that they could take it over. And they were doing all kinds of underhanded things. And Kucinich figured it out, figured out that most local city officials were on the take. They were they ran a radio host out of his job because he gave Kucinich a fair interview, all kind really, really good book explaining all of that. Um, Oh, Kevin Pafrath has a rally in San Diego tonight at six o'clock. Meet Kevin. Please check that out. If you're in San Diego, go to the rally. Boston Dynamic Dogs. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's pretty much it. I want to thank the Vasa Law Firm in Sweden, all my Patreon supporters for helping this channel grow. This is very different from the normal channel content. I tried to get Elon and Robo Taxis and Boring Company in it. And I think we got some of that in there. Would have liked more from that, but... Um, Really, really enjoyed this. Thanks to Mark Plot, Matt Senkow, and other moderators for moderating the chat, especially when you have a political conversation like this, you can get some really uncomfortable. We wanted to keep the chat reasonably calm. And, and Mark is probably hard. I told Mark to be harder than usual, and he's usually already hard. Um, yeah, no, Matt Senko, Cleveland's utility, uh, Muni Light, was attacked by CEI, which was a, a utility company nearby, and they shut off Muni Light's access to other sources of electricity. They interfered with the operations of Muni Light. They did all kinds of underhanded things. They were buying off local officials, all kinds of crazy. They tried to assassinate Kucinich, just absolutely crazy stuff. Um, Tesla Times says, when does anyone think FSD will be ready for real-time robo-taxi? I believe that FSD is going to be real and live in cars by the end of this year and that a robo taxi network will be operating somewhere by the end of 2022. I tend to be optimistic on my timeframes, but I still think somewhere in the world, Florida, Texas, California, China, somewhere we will see Tesla robo taxi network operating by the end of 2022. Damien asks, how do you explain China is top heavy in government involvement in the economy yet very successful economically? I actually think that's not correct. I don't, I think China has recognized, I think for, starting with Deng Xiaoping and going to the present leadership in China, they figured out if we let the economy run, it will grow the economy greatly. And I'm not saying that there aren't problems in China, but they figured out it's better to be less powerful in a mass in a quickly growing economy than very powerful in an economy that stinks. Would you rather be the, the premier of China or the, the head of North Korea? That was basically the choice. They figured it out. They made that choice. We're making the opposite choice in America. 
we're going the opposite direction. We're destroying our economy. Um, Jim Whitehead says, Dennis's life sounds like messing with the local mob. The mob was involved in the story. My personal opinion is that government itself is organized crime, but I'm extreme, you know. Let's see. Uh, all right, thanks for asking hard questions. I don't, did I make him squirm? I didn't think I made him squirm. Um, I don't know. I thought he did really well. I really love that guy. Are you familiar with PG Enid's recent history regarding the California fires and the San Bruno gas pipeline explosion? No, I am not familiar with that. Please uh, comment on the video with a link to the story. I won't see it in the chat quickly enough in time to, to click to it, but if you comment in the on the video itself with a link to whatever you're talking about, I will take a look at it. I mean, PG and E is, is working with Tesla to do uh, grid storage, so I think there's some hope there. But you know, California is a mess, if you ask me. All right, so everybody, I want to thank everyone for watching. Please support the channel on Patreon. Thank you to the Vasa Law Firm. Check out my other videos, uh, t-shirts, and other merch, mainly the stainless steel water bottle that says Elon on it at elonbits.com. Thanks again to Mark Plot, Jim Whitehead, Matt Sankow, other moderators for helping keep the chat in, in sane. And thank you very much to Dennis Kucinich. If you're in Cleveland, I, my opinion, vote for Dennis Kucinich. Not perfect, but better than anybody else. So 